FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. And guess what? It's October 1st, 2019. Well, October, the month of crashes. Will we see a repeat? (laughs) Is it going to happen? Well, probably not because you're expecting it. But what we can do, we've got Mickey Fulp on the line and we are going to review last month's numbers, performance, and some really interesting numbers stick out there, but I'm going to let Mickey talk about them. Mickey, as always, welcome back. So we're on to stock markets first, and they've resumed their upward climb. Well, it was an interesting month indeed, Kerry. We hit mid-month highs that were close to pushing all-time highs, then trickled down uh, the rest of the month and vacillated. And it was really due to geopolitics, uh, the trade war, Brexit difficulties with the Eurozone, the Iranian Saudi debacle. And last but certainly not least in my mind is the troubles between uh, Hong Kong and China. Mm. So really it became a risk on risk off environment for the last half of the month. Dow closed at 26,917, still up almost 2% on the month, uh, over 1% on the quarter. S&P 500, similarly, 2,977, 1.7% on the month, and a little bit more than 1% on the quarter. NASDAQ, 79,99, up a half a percent on the month, basically flat on, on the quarter, lost just a tad. And the Russell 2000, uh, had a nice month, um, up almost 2% to 1523, but it continues to lag based on last month's uh, 5% loss. It's down 3% on the quarter. Yeah, and it's interesting to note that the S&P and the Dow are getting close to all-time monthly closing highs, very, very close to that. We might very well see it this coming month. You never know. Hey, so our lesser markets... Uh, not lesser to the markets where they're located in. To but, the can- uh, Canadians, yeah, maybe well, not, but uh, uh, there's Canadian. only 33 million of them, so. <laughs> they don't count. Uh, uh, but the Canadian, We should be the 51st yeah. state, in my opinion. Well, I think they should just rename the country and call it USAC, United States and Canada. And it's makes not a bad sense. thing, except they call them provinces, and they got uh, half of them have socialist governments. So maybe we don't want that. Yeah, well, maybe... If we could deport uh, Justin Trudeau, it wouldn't be such a bad thing. <laughs> but even the Canadians... <laughs> we'll ask the Canadians that uh, coming up here with the election this month. So. Oh, God. Yeah, so the TSX uh, up a bit? TSX has really tracked the Dow this year. I, I'm quite impressed with its performance. It closed at 16,659, up 1.3%, uh, up exactly equal to the Dow at 1.7% on the quarter. And if you add the year to date, uh, they're both, uh, I'm doing this in my head, up around 16, 16.5% for the year. Uh, that's opposed to the Toronto Venture Exchange, uh. which hit its year-to-date low on uh, yesterday, the end of the month at 559 for a 5% loss, 4.5% loss on the quarter. We have had no Labor Day rally. In fact, it continues to drift down on very low volumes. And the price of gold going down last couple of days hadn't helped that. Meanwhile, uh, the emerging market index we use, the MSCI, was better for the month, but Trade issues continue to uh, to haunt China, if you will. It was up to 1,001, up 1.7% on the month, but down 5% on the quarter. Um, here's a tidbit for you. China has had five months continuous now of a PMI less than 50 which right. means their economy is contracting five months in a row. Uh, once again, they can't win a, 
a trade war with the U.S. We wonder when they're going to realize that. And finally, the VIX spent the month in the, the mid to uh, moderately low teens, uh, 15 to 18 or so, uh, closed at 16 and a quarter. So mm -hmm. moderately low volatility over the month. Yeah, and it's probably going to go down some more in all likelihood uh, because that market peaks and then it trails off pretty quickly. Uh, time decay. All that good stuff. So let's look at our, <laughs> our yeah. currency markets and uh, money markets here. Well, the dollar had a very good month up to a, uh, a high since uh, May of 2017 at 99.4. And if you remember, Carrie, that that May uh, value two and a half years ago was coming off a value of 103 right after right. Uh, right before Trump was inaugurated. So it was on its way down. But now it's on its way up. Half percent gain again, three percent on the quarter uh euro continues weak with the Very brexit weak. difficulties and germany get this germany pmi at a 10-year low so 10-year low is the, the toward the end of the global economic crisis um at 41 so 50 is is neutral so that uh, that economy is starting to tank it looks like a recession is coming in the eurozone it closed at 109 down almost a percent on the month and almost four percent or better than four percent on the quarter. Uh, meanwhile, the Fed did what was expected with a 25 basis point cut in interest rates that was baked into the markets, which basically did not react. But get this, Gary, after this announcement, 10-year T-bonds actually went up. Uh, so we have a 1.6% eight percent rate yesterday that's a 12 percent gain on the month figure that out uh, fed cuts rates and and the bonds bond rates go up maybe it was uh, uh less than expected i don't think so but uh, it really the u.s dollar is the only game on the block right now and mm -hmm. and it's become a safe haven much like gold has become and yeah. finally bitcoin it's back Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is volatility. It lost 13.5% on the month. It's lost 33% of its value of the quarter. Now it costs 82.65 to buy a Bitcoin. And I haven't checked the electricity costs of mining a Bitcoin lately. Last year it was around 7,000. I suggest that uh, you can probably mine a Bitcoin uh, for just about what it's worth right now. Yeah, and I would just note that this has gone back effectively uh, to its May low, May of uh, 2019. And um, my guess is it's going to test its low at 3,200. If it breaks that, then we're going to see it go way down. I wasn't expecting this rally. Got it up to a closing price of uh, 12,323 monthly close. It was a little bit higher that. And that on the daily close, although it never really closes, so I don't know what that means. But yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know? it never closes. But, it's it's always illiquid, but it never yeah. closes, Gary. Right. <laughs> but you can expect you can expect it to continue going down and test that thirty two hundred, well, fifty two hundred, four thousand, thirty eight, thirty four. Those are the uh, resistance points. Just keep an eye out for them, and you'll see it's really obvious. So well, you you can keep your eye out. Yeah. I tend to ignore it except for once a month. So, okay, well, I'm just uh, saying if you're thinking of buying this stuff at this point because you think it's a buying opportunity, you might want to think twice about it. But where there's really a buying opportunity, as always, is in the metals other than palladium. Well, gold spent most of the month or two thirds of the month better than fifteen hundred dollars an ounce, uh, driven by a strong. Uh, DXY driven down. Uh, it came off that high of 15.52. It looks like it's in the, in the middle of a, of a, at least a minor correction testing resistance. Closed yesterday at 14.72, down three percent on the month, but still up four and a half percent on the quarter. Uh, silver. Uh, the bugs wish it was still the poor man's gold. 
I would say it's not at 1697, lost 7% on the month, but it was up 11% on the quarter. Platinum uh, was a high of something around 950, and it lost 50 bucks yesterday on this precious metal sell off. It closed at 879 down almost 6% on the month, but still it's up from those very low lows, the triple bottom we talked about last month. It was up 5% on the quarter. And palladium, who knows? It's just up and up and up. Yeah. It's up 200 bucks on uh, on its low on the month, uh, now at 1655, up 9% on the month, up 9% on the quarter. It makes no sense at all. Yeah, well, uh, here's a and yeah, here's an interesting number, Mickey. When we first started doing this, I got it so many years ago, back in December of 2011, price of palladium was 654. It subsequently, and we're always talking about monthly closes on the show, of course, it subsequently hit a low of 400 something. I don't remember what it was exactly. So it's gone up 1200. Actually, here it is. 491 was its low and now it's at 1655 so by far besides bitcoin the most uh, volatile and highest returning uh natural resource other than maybe some of the uh, base metals and we don't really track them but of the precious metals by far the highest return on it well i think it's the highest return on anything carry i mean it's uh it's up 50 50- Almost 60% this year it closed uh, over the year over year up almost yeah, 60%. Uh, in late September of last year, it was trading at 1,070. So uh, we miss that. Most mm-hmm. analysts miss that. Uh, it has gone exponential. It's retraced a couple of times, but there still remains, despite all this electric vehicle uh propaganda that we're hit with in the, in the uh, news constantly, the business news. Uh, there's plenty of gasoline powered uh, automobiles still being built and that's where most of the palladium demand is from and it continues to go up as it continues in deficit. Uh, meanwhile, uh, another industrial metal has not been doing so well and that's copper. It closed the month up a couple of pennies to 259, but it's down 4% on a quarter. Um, It's really getting hit now by the PMIs that we've already mentioned in China and Germany, uh, fears of pending recession, maybe not in the US, but in other parts of the world. Uh, It remains in deficit for the year with, uh, with demand exceeding supply by about five days of four or five days of production. Inventories remain low. So the fundamentals are still pretty solid. But these trade wars uh, uh, trump all. To, and that is an intended pun. And <laughs> until uh, there's some, until the Chinese yeah. finally realize they're going to have to deal uh, with the U.S. and and not, uh, not say yes and then back off at the last minute, which they continue to do. Uh, The base metal complex, industrial metal complex, in my opinion, will not do well. I have a question for you about copper, Mickey. Uh, You know, I watch it just like you, but in terms of actual consumption, has there ever been a down year in the past 20 or 30 years for copper? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Financial Survival Network is brought to you today by Orin Resources, a junior exploration company with the appetite of a major. It's hot on the trail of the next globally significant discovery, creating enormous potential upside for you, the shareholder. Orin is one of the most aggressive exploration companies pursuing high-grade, scalable gold and copper deposits and has a premier seven-project portfolio, including its two flagships, Committee Bay in the Arctic and Sombrero in Peru. Orin's unparalleled technical team and highly experienced management has a history of success in advancing and monetizing exploration assets. No wonder Orin's been called one of the best in the junior exploration sector. Orin trades on the TSX and the NYSE under AUG. To learn more, go to orinresources.com. That's A-U-R-Y-N resources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 
I would imagine that 1974 was a down year. I don't have the charts in front of me, but certainly we track that mm -hmm. on a on a on a yearly basis. And I would imagine that years of significant recession, so uh, 1974 would come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in 2008, there was a, probably a drop in demand or 2009 plus global economic crisis. But year over year, uh, with the exception of, of very few years since 1900, the annualized rate of growth of copper demand is 3.4% per yeah, I'm looking, year. I just found a chart. Thank you for internets. Uh, and it shows like what looks like an 06, uh, 07, 08, 09. It kind of didn't go down. It just was flat. And then uh, from that point on, it just went straight up. And this well, chart, that's driven by China. Yeah, the chart is yeah. just straight up. So even with China, I don't see them turning back now. Well, we, but we're not even talking China. We're talking year over year yeah. rate of growth since 1900. And it really has to do, Kerry, with the fact there's 85 million more people on the planet every mm -hmm. year. Most right. of those are, are in, South, in Eastern Asia uh, those population increases in sub-Saharan Africa, and certainly in the case of Eastern Asia, it's becoming uh, rapidly electrified. Uh, that said, there's still 25% of people on this planet that go to bed in the dark and they get up when, at dawn. They don't. Yeah, they can't the flip on a light switch. So <laughs> that demand for copper yeah. will continue because you can't tra uh, uh, transport electricity without copper. Yeah. I totally agree. And it's just interesting. So uh, the market gyrations really kind of happen independently of the underlying economic realities that we need more and more of this stuff and it's harder and harder. And like you said, it's in deficit production now. So maybe scrap will make up the difference, but at some point the line's going to cross. Well, that deficit is, uh, Will cannot be made up with scrap because China now has uh, put uh, onerous restrictions on scrap coming into the country. So yeah. uh, the demand really is for refined concentrates right now, or concentrates sent to China for refining. They're trying to build out their refinery capacity, much as they've done in the zinc market. Uh, right. So uh, copper is the mid to long term fundamentals are copper of copper are compelling uh, the month to month or even year to year perturbations of the price uh, reflect really what copper does. And it's a, it's a forward economic indicator uh, for the health of, you, of the world economy. And, and, yeah. but right now the trade war is uh, trumping all. Yeah. For right now and pun intended. Hey, so ratios, not a big, uh, Big story there, other than the uh, platinum to palladium ratio, which continues to just sink. Well, it's at an all time low, and I circled that on our spreadsheet, uh, really. And what happened is platinum's, platinum's downturned over the month or, mm -hmm. or uh, went up uh, quite robustly and actually uh, made some gains on, on palladium by mid month. But uh, uh, this latest run of palladium uh, has driven that ratio to an all-time low of 0.53. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. And hey, I would just point out, even though we didn't highlight it, the uh, the gold to silver ratio back up to 86.7. So it, it dropped a little bit to 83.1 last month. So we might be seeing uh, when the correction, when the... Cons I should really wouldn't call it a correction in the metals market, call it more a consolidation because uh, it was really been expected. It's just the surprising thing is that it took till now to do it, but we probably will see the compression in that number resume this month or next. Well, silver is always volatile, uh, more volatile or generally more volatile on the uptick and, and on the downtick uh, compared to gold and, um, Gold went down and silver went down more. You know, silver came off a price of 1950 mm. mid month when gold hit 1552. Silver, I think, actually it hit 1954 for a close, and it came off that like uh, like a lead balloon. 
Now, Mickey, let's take a look at energy. Well, it was a very volatile month. Uh, it was basically flat till mid-month when the Yemenis or the Iranians flew a bunch of drones and took out half of the Saudis refinery capacity. So they were they lost 5.7 million barrels a day uh, of refining capacity. Uh, luckily, uh, the markets did not really react very much to that. Price went up at WTI, went up 64 bucks briefly, but come came right off. Um, closed on, on a big down tick as, as these fears of shortages kind of were uh, assuaged there. But uh, we're looking at uh, WTI at $54 uh, at the end of the month for a 2% loss, 7% loss on the quarter. Brent uh, closed the month off uh, two. It was off six tenths percent, closed at 60, 78 down 4.7% on the quarter. Uh, really, U.S. production is making up for this a record 12 and a half million barrels a day. Our imports are down uh, significantly less than 7 million barrels a day on average, and exports are up, predicted up to 4 million barrels of exports as more Permian pipelines come on by year end. And, uh, and also, uh, we have uh, lesser production coming out of Venezuela over the month. So uh, what it really has done is, especially with these new Permian pipelines, it's knocked natural gas uh, uh, back again, although it was up four cents on a month. It's at 2.33. Um, there's just too much gas. Yeah. And finally, uranium. Uh, remains flat in that 25 plus or minus range, close the month at 25.50. It actually ticked up about 50 cents uh, from its low during the month as we anticipate the Section 232 uh, uh, movements or whatever the Trump administration mm -hmm. is going to do. And that comes uh, in two weeks. October 14th is the expected date. And Trump is on on record time and time again uh, as being positive for doing something to help the U.S. domestic uranium industry. I was listening to some uh, news story or reading a story on The Wire. Uh, Saudi was commenting that now they seldom ever see a U.S. tanker coming to pick up oil to bring it back to the U.S., where 10 years ago, half the tankers, two-thirds of them going to Saudi ports, were American tankers. So that just illustrates what's happened with the shale revolution. They might be, the drilling rigs might be down, but the production is headed up, like you said, because of the new pipelines opening from the Permian Basin. So we're just going to see more of that. Well, we basically don't get very much oil uh, from the Middle East anymore. And the oil we do get is heavy Saudi crude, but in terms of imports, uh, way behind Canada, uh, way behind Mexico, way behind Venezuela. U.S. is is well on its way to being uh, oil and gas independent. We are the world's largest producers. We're the world's largest exporter of natural gas. And uh, light crude uh, exports are increasing by leaps and bounds on a monthly basis. Uh, remarkable. All right, Mickey. Well, that is it for this month's monthly major market review. We will uh, resume next month in November, and I'm sure it will tell an interesting story. You know, October is the month of crashes, as we know, not that we're necessarily anticipating one now, but certainly increased volatility is on the horizon. Make sure you go to Mickey's site. That's mercenarygeologist.com. His Twitter feed is at mercenarygeo. Check out our site financialsurvivalnetwork.com and Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz. We actually have a Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Mickey, we will catch up with you next month. Look forward to it, Carrie. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.